Hi, I'm Trenton. And I'm Giovanna. And, and this, this is, is Next, Next Gen, Gen News. News. At Next Gen News, we bring news to the next generation. Whether you're at school or at home, we are here to bring you news you should know about. Without further ado, let's head to Giovanna for our top story. We can probably all agree that 2020 has been a bit like this meme. From COVID-19 to murder hornets to the past of Kobe Bryant and Chadwick Boseman, this year has been a raging dumpster fire. As if things couldn't get any worse, our planet is simultaneously combusting and drowning. It is wildfire season, and after experiencing over 13,000 lightning strikes, California is ablaze. In addition to destroying and displacing people from their homes, the smoke has polluted the air and has drifted to as far as Kansas. More than 14,000 firefighters from all over the world have flown in to combat these flames. On the other side of the U.S., we have the opposite problem, as Hurricane Laura recently made her way to Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas. This powerful storm increased to a Category 4 hurricane, but luckily did not cause as much damage as expected. And finally, let's travel across the world to the Middle East, where torrential rain has flooded Pakistan and Afghanistan, killing over 80 people and destroying hundreds of homes. This tremendous rainfall shatters records that date back to about 100 years. Although fires and floods seem like opposites, they are actually very much related. These wildfires, hurricanes, and floods are all caused by extreme weather patterns due to climate change. Let's start with the wildfires. As climatologists put it, California is a perfect recipe for fire. Combine their lack of rainfall and dry vegetation with increased temperatures, and all you need is a little spark, and voila, a wildfire. Although hurricanes are very different from wildfires, they have also become more dangerous due to the increased temperatures on land and in the water. Warmer air means increased moisture, providing additional fuel for hurricanes. Additionally, rising sea levels make the storms surge even higher. This increase in air and water temperature also relate to increased rainfall. The more moisture in the air, the more precipitation. If only this extreme rain could put out this dumpster fire of a year. Well, given our luck so far in 2020, I'm not counting on it. But thank you to all of our firefighters and first responders that have been on the front lines during these disasters. Now it's our turn to put a stop to climate change. These extreme weather patterns should be a call to action for us humans. As my mom always says, you make the mess, you clean it up. Not only is our planet at a tipping point, but so is our country. August 23rd marked another police shooting of a 29-year-old African-American man, Jacob Blake. Blake was shot at seven times and hit by four bullets. He survived the shooting, but is paralyzed from the waist down. Many athletes and sports teams are taking a stand against these shootings. Let's now hear from the NBA star, LeBron James. I know people get tired of hearing me say it, but we are scared as black people in America. Black men, black women, black kids, we are, we are terrified. If you're sitting here telling me that there was no way to subdue that gentleman um, or, or detain him or to just before the firing of guns, um, then you, you, you're sitting here and you're lying to not only me, you're lying to every African American, every black person in the community because we see it over and over and over. Immediately following Jacob Blake's shooting, NBA team the Milwaukee Bucks organized a boycott that prompted the NBA to postpone all playoff games for that day. Major League Baseball and hockey also protested games, but the NBA and its players have been key to spreading awareness and enacting change. All NBA courts have Black Lives Matter painted on them, and players get to choose from different social justice messages to display on their jerseys, such as How Many More, Justice Now, and Vote. Speaking of voting, the NBA recently announced that all league-owned stadiums will be turned into voting sites for the election on November 3rd to make sure more people would get to share their voice. Additionally, LeBron himself recently launched an organization called More Than a Vote, which brings together prominent black athletes and artists with a common goal, fighting against voter suppression and lifting black voices. But let's hear from LeBron himself about it. 
as a community, we really, we really want change. And it doesn't not only just end in November, but it starts there. Um, it starts there. And, um, but we got to continue to still keep our foot on the pedal then. Even if we get what we want, we still have to, we still need more. What, is, what are we getting? Because right now of what's going on is not, it's just not okay. And, um, but I hope I can continue to uplift my community, uplift communities all over America, uplift the black community. Um, I said, that's part of the reason why I started more than a vote to, you know, just to get people to understand how important our voices are. Props to LeBron and other athletes for using their platform to stand up for what they think is right. But you don't have to be King James to stand up for what you believe in. No voice is too small to be heard, and voting is an important way to create that change. Helping others to get to the polls and vote this upcoming election is a hot topic. And speaking of hot topics, that spotlight has recently been given to the U.S. Postal Service or the USPS. That's right. For those who aren't going to an NBA stadium or a polling place to vote, they rely on the USPS to deliver their mail-in ballot. Let's go to Trenton to hear more. Let's get to the rundown. After losing $10 billion as a result of the pandemic, the USPS has made cutbacks that have many concerns for election time. Worried that disruptions in service will mean that many mail-in ballots cannot be counted. Meanwhile, the U.S. Postmaster, Louis DeJoy, says this will not be a problem. As we head into the election season, I want to assure this committee and the American public that the Postal Service is fully capable and committed to delivering the nation's election mail securely and on time. This sacred duty is my number one priority between now and Election Day. Sounds like there's a lot more to this story that we need to know about. Let's hear from Oscar for today's edition of Now You Know. Hey guys, it's Oscar and I'm here to shine a spotlight on this hot topic, the USPS. Did you know that the original Postmaster General was the Benjamin Franklin? And that was before the colonies gained their independence from Britain. Yep, during the Revolutionary War, communication was key to keep their colonies united. And this even included sending letters across the Atlantic Ocean to Britain. There were no phones or computers or planes, so messages had to zoom their way to their destination by horseback riders and boat. After 1775, Franklin was paid a whopping $1,000 for his position. And boy, did he do it well. He set up new delivery routes and had mail wagons running day and night to deliver the mail even faster. At this time, there were about 75 post offices throughout the 13 colonies. Today, we have over 40,000 post offices in the U.S. that deliver 212 billion pieces of mail each year. Amazingly, it would only cost me 55 cents to send this letter from California to my cousin Alyssa in Texas. And finally, did you know that the unofficial motto is a throwback to postal carriers during the war between the Greeks and the Persians around 500 BC? Neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night stay these couriers from their swift completion of their appointed rounds. Well, I hope neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night will keep the mail and ballots from reaching their destination this November. So that is all about the post office, and now you know. Thanks, Oscar. I'm definitely following that one in. Today I learned. Who knew sending mail was so inexpensive? I'm going to start sending mail more often. 55 cents? What a steal. Dang, she can really surf. Who is that? Well, Trenton, meet Kaju Sambe, the first female professional surfer from Senegal, a country in West Africa. When you think of surfers, you might picture the beaches of Southern California, but Kaju takes us on a trip to Dakar to surf the waters of the coastal capital city. She was initially inspired to begin surfing when kayaking off the coast of her fishing village. Now let's hear from Kaju herself. Et souvent, je pars mon avec mon kayak à côté les personnes qui font du surf tout le temps, et je vois tout le temps les personnes qui partent surf. Je dis. Mais où sont les filles qui surfent et 
J'ai dit, mais pourquoi pas d'aller pas se faire représenter mon country, représenter l'Afrique, représenter le Sénégal en tant que blogueur, en tant que fille, parce que j'ai jamais vu une noire fille qui allait surfer. Breaking the tradition of getting married, staying home and supporting a family was a difficult road to take. But after being discovered by Rhonda Harper, founder of Black Girls Surf, Kaju now trains young girls to surf at Black Girls Surf Camps, which have locations in Ghana, Liberia, Senegal, and Sierra Leone. The goal of Black Girls Surf is to increase representation in professional surfing, and Kaju is passionate about pursuing this goal. I'm so happy, fier, it's something that's extraordinary. All the time, when I wake up, Le matin, je me dis, Radio, tu as quelque chose à faire. Tu représentes quelque chose partout dans le monde, tu dois toujours droit au but. Il ne faut pas laisser tomber. Whatever the people say, n'importe quoi qu'ils ont dit, n'écoute pas. Allez de l'avant, continue ce que tu fais et représenter pour les filles et battre pour les filles pour avancer de l'avant et comme ça, tout le monde peut se lever et croire qu'il peut faire du surf. Takaju Sambe, thank you for leading a new wave of professional surfers and for showing us that black girls can surf. Surfing is what Kaju likes to do. Me, I'm here and for next gen news. Next a young rapper spits the truth. Listen up so you can learn too. Hey, that was pretty good. <laughs> Well, I've been working on my rap game ever since I heard this 11-year-old in Gaza, Abdel Rahman Al Shanti rap. Have you heard of him? No, I haven't. Well, he's this week's person to watch. Let's take a listen to this 11-year-old's rhymes and head to Oscar to learn more. We ain't no fresher than hope, riddle me death. The rest of y'all know where I'm lyrically at. Can't none of y'all mirror me today. Cause in the way I'ma let you stop it for cause I'm lame. But I say I'ma do something, I'ma do it. Look out Eminem, you've got company. Although Oshanti may be 11 years old, his rhymes on war and hardship in Palestine have reached thousands of people. The lyrics of his song, Gaza Messenger Go, I'm here to tell you our lives are hard. We got broken streets and bombs in the yard. Pretty powerful stuff. Though Arabic is his first language, he raps in fluent English, a skill that he says he learned by listening to American rappers, including Tupac, DJ Khaled, and his favorite artist and idol, Eminem. Al Shanti is using rap to spread an important message. Let's hear from him to learn more. My message talks about peace. And uh, I want to convey it to the largest number of people. And I want to show, you know, I want to show how is the life in Gaza to outside. I want to show them how we are children supposed to like be like the other children from the outside, from America. And with that, this lyrical genius, Abdel Rahman Al Shati, is this week's Person to Watch. Well, that about wraps up our show for today. It was so much fun. We wish you could stay. Ooh, I see you. Well, I'm Giovanna. And I'm Trenton. And, and we, we are Next Gen, Gen News. News. Bringing news to the next generation.